read, this becomes very important when the priests, when the uh, prophets show up. Because they're going to keep saying, you're not, you're, you're worshiping other gods. And I want to tell you now, that worshiping those other gods was probably a lot more fun than waiting for the ark to show up. <laughs> because you need, you need to hear this, and you need to remember this. Because Baal, or Baal, however you want to say it, and Astarte, and Astarte's friend, the Astartes, or Astartes, the, and there's no way to say that that's right. Um, they show up all the time. And here's the thing you need to hear that makes this important. Both Baal, or Baal, and Astartes, they are a male and a female god. Baal is the male. Baal. No, think of this as no vowels in this language. So Baal sounds an awful lot like El. I know, drop the first syllable. Well, then you got it. Yeah. So Baal is a name for God, a God. It is not Yahweh, it's Baal. And he's a male God. No question about him being male. He's got all the parts. And Astarte is a female God. And throughout, from, from the, po the point we're reading now, all the way through to Babylon, these two gods get mentioned over and over and over again. When we get to First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, you'll see them just pop up all over. And how are they worshipped? They're worshipped. You make sacrifice. When they get really, really crazy, they actually sacrifice children. But before they get there, there is sexual activity connected with the god. And the priests of Baal and the priests of Astarte, or priestesses, <coughs> are, I mean, there's some people who offer sacrifice. You'll know that story when we get to it. But there are other people who function as temple prostitutes. And let's face it, that's a lot more fun than waiting for the ark to show up. And it's right there. Where are these gods worshipped? Not necessarily in temples, they're worshipped in nature. In fact, when Baal and Astarte get together, it's usually around March 21st, and suddenly you see the results of their getting together. It's called spring. Didn't the Greeks and, have a, have oh, yeah. a similar thing? But they at least had a few others more violent. But, but these are, so, so the symbol of Baal is a pole. And the symbol of Astarte is a grove of trees. Now, this is where Carol Trower gets really upset. Because I'm about to tell you, and that you're going to be upset too. So there's a psalm that everybody loves. 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? What's up in the hills? Trees. Trees. That's where Astarte and Baal are worshipped, up in the hills. Is that where I find God, my help? No. My help comes from Yahweh, the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Not the copulating gods who make spring happen, but the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. You know how the rest of the song goes. So it's... A, what we take as, I mean, there are pictures of this. There are, there's art about this. There's photography with the psalm on it. What we take is this wonderful bucolic scene. I lift up my eyes to the hills and my help comes from the, no, it doesn't come from the hills. It comes from Yahweh, who's down here with us. It's really a, a message against those other gods. And these guys are going to, these gods are going to show up over and over and over again. And the entire business in the Hebrew scriptures, the entire business, there are no exceptions to this, of, of prohibitions against homosexuality are related to those two gods. All of it, every single word, relates to when you worship Baal, you have sex with a male. And when you worship a star day, you have sex with a female. And both sexes can do it. And that's the whole basis right there in that chapter. You have to keep that in your head when you listen to other people. 
The, and so every act of fornication in the Old Testament is considered to be idolatry. Because it is. <laughs> You're worshiping another god. It's not about... Would you have to do the lady again? The trees? <laughs> <laughs> been misused. There are, there are other evidences of Baal and Astarte in, in American history, in our lives, in our current milieu, and you don't have to have sex, but you could certainly sacrifice yourself to them with no, not too much trouble. So this passage sets up the problem. The problem is that they, they choose a way to, to live in the community, in, the, in that land, which they took, um, that forgets about who got them there in the first place. They're unfaithful, and they adopt all of the practices of those religions, which include um, the sexual pra pra practices as well as a huge load of injustice, toward, especially toward people who are not the same as them. So what does God do? God is really upset and he lets them lose. That's the way, that's, why, that's how their losses are explained. I think you can explain it in several other ways, but. Now what does God do? Verse 16. Then Yahweh raised up charismatic leaders called judges, who delivered them out of the power of those who plundered them. Yet they did not even listen to their judges, <laughs> for they lusted after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their ancestors had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord. They did not follow their example. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with, Yahweh was with the judge, and he delivered them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the, Yahweh would be moved to pity by their groaning because of those who persecuted and oppressed them. And whenever the judge died, they would relapse. Mm -hmm and behave worse than their ancestors, following other gods, worshiping them, and bowing down to them. They would not drop any of the, their practices or their stubborn ways. So the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel. He said, because the people have transgressed my covenant that I commanded their ancestors, and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive out from them uh, any of the nations that Joshua left when he died. In order to test Israel, whether or not they would take care or walk in the way of the Lord as their ancestors did, the Lord had left those nations, not driving them out at once, and had not handed them over to Joshua. Now these are the nations that the Lord left to test all those in Israel who had no experience of any war in Canaan. Then you have a list. The Philistines. And he says the five lords of the Philistines those are the cities that still exist along the period of the, the piece of property we call the Gaza Strip. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay? Gaza, Ashkelon, there's a list of them. They, they're, they're still there. They're still a problem. Now it's not Philistines, it's Palestinians. The Canaanites, the Sidonites, the Hivites, who lived on Mount Lebanon. And from Mount Baal Hermon, guess who gets worshipped there? as far as Lebo Hamat. They were for the testing of Israel and to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their ancestors by Moses. So the Israelites lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, you've heard of them before, um, Ammonites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. They're the people in Jerusalem. And they took their daughters as wives for them and their own daughters they gave to their sons, and they worshiped their gods. Now, so the argument that you have just heard is why is it that they didn't get the land free and clear? 
Why did God leave those countries, those other peoples in the land? The argument here is to test them. Do you like that argument? No. That's why we don't read Judges. Yeah. Don't read it. What do Jews say about that today? I say this, well, it depends on what do Jews say. So here's, here's, here's the breadth of Judaism. Mm -hmm. So it depends on who you are. If you're a Zionist, if you're an ultra conservative Zionist, you say, yep, that's it. Our job is to drive those people out. Let's build a settlement in Hebron. Mm -hmm. Or if you're on this side, you say our job is to make peace with them and live together peacefully. The idea from the beginning is that they're going to live together peacefully. This is a new argument that they're not going to drive them out. So this is this is the hand of the writer. Got to explain this. And again, think of the context of the writing. It's writing when they've come back from being in exile. There's they, they are no people. They are nothing. They can be. They have the city of Jerusalem has no walls. So to. to to keep the nation together, you tell stories like this, which, you know, um, say we gotta band together, we gotta be faithful to one another and not, I mean the problem, again, when they came back from, from Babylon is, they're intermarrying. You gotta stop intermarriage. There's a good reason why not to do it. You marry them, you take their gods. So for probably, the last 300 years, maybe longer, well, at least since the Reformation, probably before, really difficult to have uh, intermarriage between people who were not German Lutheran and people who were um, something else, like German Catholic or Polish Catholic. You know, we've all even lived through that yeah. stuff where, you know, people marrying outside their faith was considered could be, you could be, um, your family could, could throw you out because of that. You know, and, and with Lutherans it was even bad enough that you could, a Swede couldn't marry, marry a German. Right. Yeah. Um, Missouri Synod couldn't marry I don't know that, I don't think they can't yet. Well, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> but that kind of stuff, so, so whenever you see someone doing a marriage with you know, where, where, where you're actually doing that, presiding at that kind of marriage, getting fewer and fewer because it's easier to get a universal life minister to do this. There's a lot going on in that. Thing. So, uh, it's a lot more than just having, being in love. Uh, yeah. I'm going back, I understand everything you said. I'm going back to why don't we read this? Because we don't want to. There's two. We, talk we about actually this. we actually stopped reading from this book of the of the of the Old Testament. We never read from Judges. Yeah, I know you said we that. never read from Judges. You can go for three years to church every <coughs> Sunday and you will never once hear a reading from Judges. Because we want to deny it. We want, yeah. Because it's it's it is uh, because it needs yeah. <laughs> because it needs lengthy explanation. Yeah, so which we have now just done. You, so you just the field is misleading. you skip over it, right? It's misleading. Yeah, and it doesn't. It, right, it doesn't. It doesn't help matters, it, it, and it won't. I mean, ultimately, you can use stuff like this to justify all kinds of things, including driving the Palestinians out of Israel, just to use that as a, or you know, driving Indians out of. Or keeping the, keeping the Spanish out. I'll, I'll give you a list. You can make your own list up. So, so we don't we don't now. Do I agree with that? Absolutely not. But what I and that's why we're actually looking at this stuff here. But now we have an hour and a half to explain it and talk it through and put it in its context. You see, the whole purpose of this year of doing Bible study here, and I know it's all me talking, and I apologize for that. But the goal of this is so that when you hear things in church, you can put them in context. And I, I don't know how else to do that, but the context is so unbelievably important. And we don't pay attention to it. We think it's like, 
reading the newspaper. We don't even believe that the, and even that, you know, context is everything. So that's what this is about. And, and, and we don't read it because there's no time in a, in a 45 minute mass to put it in context. Are there other books that we skip over to? Oh yeah. There's a, a good chunk of the Hebrew scriptures. And it's worth saying that for a good chunk of time, at least from the Reformation until the 1960s, well, 1958 is, is the year, we didn't read at all from the Hebrew scriptures. You realize that? Christians didn't read the Hebrew scriptures in worship at all. That changed in 1958. Why? Because the Lutheran, the, the American Lutheran Church and the Lutheran Church in America, Lutherans did this, said, we're cutting off half the scripture, let's start adding an old, and it was called Old Testament reading. Mm -hmm. Look at the, the, the old, old red hymn book. Old Testament, Epistle, and Old Testament, Psalm, and Epistle. Well, I heard with the Gospel and the Epistle. Yes, because, because we didn't read the Hebrew scriptures. Ever? Two epistles. It was the first and second reading. We you might have had to. Three lessons, three readings. Maybe you did, but lots of other people did. So, so we, so we cut off that whole. Starting thing. when though, like when? Um, around the Reformation. Okay. Why? I don't know. Well, you know, it's interesting. I don't. I just think there's some decisions I had no clue about, and nobody asked. Nobody asked me. But before hey, that, the, before that, the Hebrew Bible was part of. Maybe. The, maybe. Certainly the Psalms, the Psalms, the Psalms, the Psalms, the Psalms. The Psalms. Yes. When that he, when, you know, if you read sermons from St. John Chrysostom or any of that crew of the so-called church fathers or the, or, the, or the monastic communities or look at liturgies from the 400s or 500s, a lot of imagery from the Old Testament was used, a lot of preaching, all of it allegorical. So, so the Hebrew scriptures were treated as allegory. Like parables. Not a bad idea, by the way. But gone. We don't do it anymore. Haven't done it since Luther. Not that Luther is to blame, but it's that period of time. So you, you got to remember that. And, and what you know about the Old Testament, where did you learn about the Old Testament? I know where I learned about, first learned about the Old Testament in Sunday school. Sunday school. Yeah. 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 But you didn't hear it in church. Well, what the Philistines are one with the guy. That's the that's the um, uh, uh, oh, Phoenicians. But but the Phoenicians and the Philistines. Oh God, this is seems are the same people. Because I remember hearing that in sermon about them. Yeah, you right, but because they live, you know, you know the story of Lydia, the dyer of purple, becomes a Christian, takes in Paul, pays the bills. Yes. Major person in the in the Bible week. So we have a church in New York now called St. Lydia's. So Lydia was a dyer of purple. Guess what she her ancestry is? She's a Phoenician. Or a Philistine. And she's living up in Asia Minor. It's Turkey. The, the, the site is in Turkey. So they were the, the Phoenicians are sea people. And they were, I mean, this this is where the Greeks do connect to this. You know, they're 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 trading and they're setting up colonies so they could trade. They're really, um... Okay, so you get judges and now you get a series of judges. And I don't want to read them all, but I do want to have you look at one thing. Uh, so so the first the first series of judges is is Othniel. And then you have have you ever heard of him? Good. He's he's in there. Uh, Ahud, ever hear of him? Nope, never. How about Shamgar? No. How about Deborah? Yes. Okay. This is an important passage because now, um, if you take that parable we looked at last week, the parable of the trees from that was in yeah. uh, Judges, and now we have Deborah. These are the oldest existent, I'm talking about language now, parts of the Bible. These things were memorized. That's why it's a song. And it probably was memorized before King David. So look at Deborah's story. Um, four, one to five. This is not, so I warn you in advance, some of this is a bit gory. Judges chapter four. And I'll start to read just because of the names, not because I feel like it. 
<clears throat> the Israelites, again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord <clears throat> after Ehud died. <clears throat> so Yahweh sold them into the hand of King Jabin of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. These places still exist. The commander of his army was Sisera. Anybody know about Sisera? You'll love this story if you, it's like watching CSI. He lived in, there's the name of his town. Then the Israelites cried out to Yahweh for help. Um, for Sisera had 900 chariots of iron and had oppressed the Israelites cruelly for 20 years. Big deal here, iron. This is the beginning of the Iron Age. So we've gone from bronze gone from the Stone Age to the Bronze Age to the Iron Age. Um, this is when there's a lot of imperial stuff happening. Now look at this. At that time, Deborah, a prophetess, first time that's word, the word is used, a wife of Lapiadot was judging Israel. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah, well, where else, be, be, between Ramah and Bethel, in the hill country of Ephraim. We've actually been there. This is the area like Mount Carmel and what's the city that's there? The, um, uh, it's, a, it's a port. Um, it starts with an H. Haifa? Haifa. Haifa. Yep. And the Israelites came up to her for judgment. There's a, there's a problem between us. The judges judged. Um, she sent and summoned Bar Bar Barak. <laughs> and then you have their names. And he's from Naphtali, which is further north. And said to him, Yahweh, the God of Israel, command you, go take position at Mount Tabor, sort of in the middle, bring 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Zebulun. I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you at the Wadi Kishon, that's the Kishon River. Still there, yeah. with his uh, chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. So this battle happens. Barak does what he says, but he says to Deborah, I'm not going alone. You're going with me. And the reason you're going with me is because um, um, the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. So this is a, this is a major person uh, who's going to deliver Israel. Barak is not the judge. He's the general. Deborah is the prophetess, and she's the judge. So they get the warriors together, and they this thing goes on for a while. Um, and in verse 12, when Sisera was told that Barak, son of Abiyam, uh, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera called out all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the troops who were with him, and they go down to Kishon. Then Deborah said to Barak, up! For this is the day on which the Lord will give Sisera into your hand. The Lord is indeed going out before you. So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 warriors following him. These are a lot of warriors for a very small part of the world. And Yahweh threw Sisera and all his chariots and all his army into panic before Barak. And Sisera got, drawn, uh, got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and the army. Um, he pursued them. And the army of Sisera fell by the sword. No one was left except Sisera. Now Sisera had fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, wife of Heber the Kenite, where there were peace between King Jabin of Hazor, Hazor and the clan of Heber uh, the Kenite. Jael came to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord. Turn aside to me, have no fear. So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. Then he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. He said to her, stand by the entrance of the tent. If anybody comes and asks you, is anyone in there? Say no. But Jael, wife of Heber, took a, now, but Jael, wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until, he was fe until it went down to the ground. He was lying fast asleep from weariness and he died. So this is, this is one of the wonderful stories we don't read in the church. Then Barak came to pursue of Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said, come and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. So he went into the tent and there was Sisera lying dead with a tent peg in his head. So on that day, God subdued King Jabin of Canaan before the Israelites. 
Then the hand of the Israelites bore harder and harder on King Jabin of Cana until they destroyed King Jabin of, uh, Jabin of Cana. Then Deborah and Barak, son of Abinoam, sang on that day, saying, this is the old, old part of the Bible. The language is ancient. They probably sang this song. They probably taught it to their kids. <coughs> and with that parable of the trees, this is literally the oldest part of the Bible. So we know it's, it, it, it mean, the, the, the Hebrew here is almost cuneiform writing. Almost. It's not, but it's very close to, to uh, the language that's called um, uh, Akkadian. And it sounds an awful lot like another song you know, several songs you know. One of them is the song of Miriam at the Red Sea. The other one is a song we sing a lot, and it's called the Magnificat. So this is a template, if you will, an ancient template for a lot of stuff that that has become part of our life. Um, we, we never read this because it's pretty gory um, in a lot of places, but you know, God helps those who are oppressed is the, is the thing. And they're always, 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 always sung by women. None of these songs that we ever sing are sung by men. They're always sung by women. So I don't want to read the whole thing, but look at verse 4. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the region of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens poured, the clouds indeed poured water. The mountain quaked before Yahweh, the one of Sinai, before Yahweh, the God of Israel. And then it keeps going on and saying, you know, what God has done. Look at verse 12. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake. Awake, utter a song, arise, Barak, lead away your captives. Um, then you have a story about the remnant. Think about this being sung at the time they came back from, from uh, exile. Um, then there's a list of all the people. And then there's a list of all the kings who get defeated. There's Megiddo there in verse um, 19. And Ta'anak, which is still a major uh, um, archaeological site today. Um, there's a lot of what's called doublets, which is a sentence that gets repeated in a slightly different way and makes the same point. Um, uh, let's go to um, the, the very end. Um, well, let's look at, at verse 28. Out of the window she peered, the mother of Sisera gazed through the lattice. Why is his chariot, this is so long in coming? Why tarry the hoofprints of his chariot? Or why does why is this lady's maid answer? Indeed, she answers the question herself. Are they not finding and dividing the spoil? A girl of two for every man. Spot spoil of dyed stuff for Sisera. Spoil of dyed stuff embroidered. Two pieces of dyed work embroidered for my neck is spoil. So perish all your enemies, Yahweh. May, but may your friends be like the sun as it rises in its might. And look at the postscript. And the land had rest for 40, 40 years, which is a long time. That's what it means. Then they do evil in the sight of the Lord. Right, this is a repeated thing. Then they do evil in the sight of the Lord. They worship the gods of, their, of the people around them. Then there's another, another um, judge. So look at the list again. Um, the fifth judge, Gideon. Right? You know this, you, you know a little bit about Gideon, right? Gideon's the guy who did, puts did, Bibles in all yes. those hills. Right. Gideon, <laughs> right. Well, that's, it's in this story. Actually, man, um, a free one. I just wanted to. Then you have a bad guy who pops up Abimelech. Abimelech. Abimelech means Melech is the word for king, Abi is father. My father is the king, which probably is a reference to a god you worship sexually, Baal. And then you have the sixth and seventh judges, which we never talk about. The eighth judge, we occasionally talk about, 
9, 10, 11, go to 12. You know this one, Samson, the judge. Now, Samson answers the question, were they connected to religion or not? Notice Deborah was a prophetess. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now look at Samson. Go to verse uh, um, 13, 1 to 25. Judges 13, 1 to 25. <laughs> yep, that's what they do. So this is this is a repetitive. This is this is and, again, and imagine telling this telling this story. You could you could memorize this story. You could memorize the book of Judges. All you got to do is know the names of the judges. They did was even on the side of the Lord. God raised up Othniel. God raised up Jehu. God raised up Deborah. God raised up Samson. So it's it's a it's a refrain. Um, uh, so God raises up these judges. They're not self-appointed. They're not anointed. God just nothing says, happens. You're God right. that somehow everybody recognizes that this is the charismatic leader. Okay. So listen to the story. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll stop thirteen one because it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a certain man of Zora. This is verse two of the tribe of the Danites. Dan and Beersheba. So Dan is up north. His name was Manoah. His wife was barren, having born no children. Do you recognize yes. that refrain? Yes. Okay, Samson, I have a great idea. I'd like to try it. I'll tell you this in a minute. Let me read the story first. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Although you are barren, having born no children, you shall conceive and bear a son. Now be careful not to drink wine or strong drink or to eat anything unclean. For you shall conceive and bear a son. And here's the line. No razor is to come on his head, for the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from birth. It is he who shall begin to deliver Israel from the land hand of the Philistines. Now, a Nazarite. A Nazarite is a, is a is sort of a, a monastic uh, community. And the, the symbol of for them is they don't drink. This is in the Hebrew scriptures. They don't. Um, they don't have sex. They don't marry, um, and they don't cut their hair. Well, how do they exist? They, they, don't, they, 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 they don't procreate, so they so die. Just out. Like they they die. <coughs> exactly. Exactly. Group of women. They It's sort of a monastic community. Like the, there's the a group scenes. of people like the Essenes, right? <coughs> Essenes of Lima. Jesus. They live out in the desert. They don't do any of these things. They do exactly what this is. Um, and they they died out. Shakers, too. They did leave us. Yeah, the Shakers are shakers working their way, but at least they have children. Um, okay. Now the thing about Nazarite is that this is a this is a this is this, again a monastic community. But Matthew's gonna take this passage Maybe in the gospel Nazareth. and he's gonna say, he's gonna quote it, he shall be a Nazarite. And so that's Matthew's way of saying that Jesus is born in Nazareth. But there's no relationship between Nazareth and a Nazarite. <laughs> Matthew, but why does Matthew do it? Because Matthew's reading this stuff in Greek. And he's reading in Greek. And there, Nazareth, a Nazarene and a Nazarite are exactly the same. So it's a, just so you have that in your head when you hear this. All right, so now he's born. Um, and he does exactly what he's told. What he's told. Doesn't drink, doesn't eat anything unclean. Is this the first mention of a Nazareth? Yes. The very first mention. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then, then in verse 8, Manoah entreats Yahweh. This, this doesn't sound like John the Baptist's father. Oh Lord, I pray, let the man of God whom you send come to us again and teach us what we're to do with this kid. And then God comes by the angel and um, uh, <coughs> our messenger, anyway. And, uh, and uh, <coughs> woman, the woman comes and gets him, and you can see what the orders are here. Um, so man, man walks down 15, says to the angel, allow us to detain you and prepare a kid for you. That should sound familiar. That's the story of Abraham and Sarah. Mm -hmm. The angel of the Lord said to the man, well, if you detain me, I will not eat your food. But if you want to prepare a burnt offering, then offer to Yahweh. 
Um, <laughs> and so this happens. And, and of course, what is your name in verse 18? So that we may honor you with your words come true. But the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name? It's too wonderful. Wonderful counselor, mighty God. So then we have the, the, the eat, uh, the kid is born, um, and then you have in verse 14, um, uh, well, let's, in the end of verse, uh, chapter 13, the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him uh, in the town of Dan, uh, between Zoar and Eshtao. Eshtao. Once Samuel went down to Tim, and then he gets stories. So this is the story of, of Samson, who's now done everything right, going down to a little Philistine, Philistine town and falling in love. Um, and Father says, is there not a woman among your kid or among all our people that you must go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, get her for me because she pleases me. And they didn't know what to do, and so they do it. And he goes down. And marries this woman, right? Yeah, right. And then you have the entire story that follows, that you all know. You know, Jet, um, Samson and Delilah. Delilah's a Philistine. Uh, she finally sweet talks him into getting his hair cut. He has no strength because not because he cut his hair, because he broke his vow. That's why if you think there's two groups of people in in New York who can't cut their hair. One of them is Hasidic Jews, just because they made a vow and the other is Sikhs, also but made a vow. And so cutting your hair is not a matter of grooming, it's a matter of breaking your promise. That's the sign of the promise, a special promise. What so, is that, the symbol of hair is is a strength or a, a well, favorite it of God? Certainly, or? is this the symbol of hair is strength? Absolutely. And when you get to, you know, you get that. It's also a symbol of, believe it or not, in this part of the Bible, it's a symbol of male beauty. And the story that underlies that is, is the story of Absalom. Remember, King yeah, uh, David's so son Absalom. He gets caught in running away because his hair gets caught, but he's very proud of his hair. It's a symbol of male beauty. In the 60s, that was true. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so you have this whole story of, of uh, Samson, and look at the things that Samson does. Besides all this military stuff, all this battling stuff, um, he, can tell, he can tell parables or, or riddles. Look at... Um, uh, he, and rather, he can um, interpret riddles. Um, look at verse um, 14. Uh, out of the eater came something to eat, out of the strong came something sweet. Uh, but nobody can explain his riddle. And finally, he tells her, what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. That's so it's a bee. Um, and then you have Yahweh. Now we're over uh, over on the on the Gaza Strip, down in Ascalon. And he kills people, and Samson's wife is still trying to figure out what he has to say. And this goes why he gets his strength. And finally, they figure it out, and he, um, what, there's the story of him, you know, killing the Philistine army with the jawbone of an ass, um, or as they translate it here, donkey. Um, and then there's yet another story about him, and then finally they figure out to cut his hair, um, and they cut his hair, and they put him in the temple. And he pulls down the temple and wipes out the Philistines, and everybody looks happy again. Except him. <laughs> Except him, because he's dead. So now you get, that's the twelfth and final judge. And now from 17 um, to 21 of, of Joshua, you get a kind of, I mean of judges, you get a kind of transition period. And the transition period is to get you to the next important person 
which is Samuel. 